Okay, so today we're in Edinburgh in the beautiful location of Holyrood Distillery. Highly recommend you check it out. So what we're going to be talking about today is distilling and specifically the use of heritage and specialty malts. So I'm joined by Callum. Um, one of the distillers here at uh, Holyrood Distillery and Colin, the sales director from Chris Malt, who's been working very closely with them on the, the use of heritage malts and specialty malts in the still. It's really exciting. They're pioneering a whole new movement. They're showing a lot of innovation here and we're going to talk through some of the products that they have ready as new make. So this one is our uh, Made by Edinburgh. So this is a real personal favourite of mine and I think it really sums up what we're doing here in a nice way. So we started off experimenting with brewer's yeast yeah. and then moved on to using crystal malt for its lovely kind of caramel toffee notes and then chocolate for the kind of roasted coffee uh, dark kind of chocolatey flavours and this for me is the greatest hit of all of them. So right, okay. we have our uh, East Lothian Scotch pot still malt. We're so happy that Chris can get this for us because it's close to the city yeah. so it's great for us. Um, and that is comboed with the Crystal 240 for like I say those lovely sweet flavours and the dark flavours of the chocolate malt as well. So of course this is uh, a little bit strong so if you want to add a little bit of water feel free but all those flavours come through in this and it's really like the greatest hits of some of the thinking that we've had. <laughs> 60. <laughs> yeah, pretty strong there, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, speaking of wine. <clears throat> like I said, water is a key. I forget that, you know, I get too used to drinking it off the still sometimes, but it super creamy. Me, it worries me how much I like it at 60. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you find that with a lot of our stuff, is it's yeah. uh, dangerously easy to drink, is how yeah. I describe a lot yeah. of it. It's so smooth for 60%, like silky yeah. smooth. Yeah, and it's, it's creamy sweet. as well. Yeah. yeah. Definitely get some of that chocolate character coming through. It's almost like, you yeah. get like chocolate digested. Yeah, or something absolutely. Like that. Yeah. Like milk chocolate on the top, yeah, yeah, and it, it just works so nicely, you know. Mm -hmm. um, try it my more. description I always go for is like the bottom of a cheesecake. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I get on this, you know. You get a bit of creaminess and cheese yeah. and that, but then you get that biscuit base at the bottom. Like, I can't believe what that's like as new make. Yeah. You know, so what that's going to be like coming out of a barrel will be phenomenal. This is the bit we're really excited about. Yeah. is Seeing that you know, the whole idea is if it tastes great just now. It's only going to taste better if we do our job right in maturation, you yeah. know? And it's super exciting to be at this point and look at all the flavors that we've achieved and see how that kicks on into the kind of next next level. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, this is a really good indicator of, of what we're trying to do just now. It's about 90% pot still. Okay. Um, and then it's generally about 8% of crystal and two of chocolate. But you can see how much the flavour comes through in just a yep. small inclusion. Yeah, yeah. We work it roughly around a 30% max inclusion of any kind of specialty malt. Okay. Purely because it turns into a nightmare drafting it out. It's like wet cake trying to get yeah. it out of there, you know? But um, we find that some of these uh, specialty malts are so kind of potent in terms of what they bring to the mix that you honestly need a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah. Things like black malt that mm. we've used. Mm -hmm. get that lovely kind of slightly burnt toast kind of vibe that especially when combined with a fruity yeast is a really kind of interesting complex flavor and we've used as little as like you know half a bag 12.5 kilos and a one point you know one one ton mash 1.25 mash yeah and it's pushing straight through the middle and you can taste it the whole way and it's wow. yeah. super interesting to see how much they can bring yeah um the black malt with the sherry yeast that we've used uh, describes like a black forest gato kind of yeah, vibe yeah, to it. Yeah. Super exciting, and yeah, seeing how those malts really can take charge of a mash is key for us as well. Because mm -hmm. as I say, we don't want to drown out some of the other guys that are in there essentially. So, yeah. especially malts have been around for decades in, in the brewing world. Yeah. Why do you think Scotland's just not embraced that? Has it just been? The looking at the spirit yield and that's yeah. been the, the thing that's driven the whole industry. I, I think so. I think, you know, I was joking with the guys earlier that if you look at some historical kind of documents talking about the yield 
comparing that to what we get on some of these, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't look great on paper, yeah. but the trade-off for us is that we're getting these flavors, mm -hmm. and I think we're really working hard to find the balance on that. It's about, you know, again, percentage inclusion, and also how we're using um, a lot of the kind of, you know, the yield thing's an interest one, because a lot of that lies on the shoulders of the yeast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think the argument's really that strong if you're just talking about it from a malt perspective. I think it's possibly, uh, you know, being shackled to tradition, as much as it's great to have a, a heritage and a name, sometimes it can really almost kind of yoke people into a certain style of thinking. And with Scotch whiskey being, you know, quite a unique and like celebrated thing for what it is, maintaining that and preserving that status is super important. And it's why we have all the institutions that we have to keep that in place. But I think the way I like to describe what we do here is we're making Scotch whiskey with a lot of Japanese whiskey principles in terms of seeing what you can do and experiment within the sort of given uh, like parameters that you have. Um, as a relatively new distiller, I do find it crazy that no one's really do dove into this before because yeah, yeah. to me this is where it's at and yeah. it's going to be so great in 5-10 years when ourselves and anyone else that's doing something similar starts to put out single malt that's like this and you know hopefully we make some waves and people start to get used to it because yeah being a brewer you know we all hunt for that elusive new malt that somebody else hasn't used and that new flavor that no one's gathered mm -hmm. and that thinking hasn't been in the whiskey realm for a while so it's great to see it start to permeate and if we can help lead the charge then i'll wave the flag there is layers of flavor in that for a new make so for me the complexity's there we've moved on now to i'm not even going to try and say this so uh, what's, the, what's the name? <laughs> this is our Japanese sake yeast uh, new make spirit, and it was actually um, Connor O'Keefe, one of our distillers here, that kind of came up with the initial idea. But he was reading uh, Masataka Takatsuru's uh, book that he wrote when he kind of came over to Campbelltown, part of Scotland, and researched what we were doing here. And we love a bit of history, and that's great inspiration for us. So. For our new make here, as well as using a sake yeast, we have again our uh, pot still malt, and more importantly in the specialty front, we have Chevalier for that lovely kind of pasty, gluey texture that has a great kind of dusty chalkiness that carries all the flavors of other malts through. And we have a really nice kind of burst of sweetness here coming from the amber malt as well. As I've said before, I'm a big fan of orange ales and red ales, so any chance to use amber malt, I'm buzzing. But this one is super cool. We get all those great malt flavors combined with a lovely little bit of strawberry and cream that we get from the sake yeast as well, into just a beautiful, complete package. I'm definitely getting sweetness. I've yeah. never had sweetness like that before. Like it's very pronounced on the tip of the tongue sweetness. It's not like um, caramelly or cloy. It's proper, you know, for a spirit that tastes that sweet. And that, you think that's come from amber malt? It's, it's the combination of them both. And then again, as we've said, the properties of Chevalier, I think it really gets like the back of your tongue going. Mm -hmm. Your saliva glands really start, I mean, it's going so much I can barely speak, you know? And it really gets your taste buds going. And it's a perfect partner for so many malts. Mm -hmm. And as well as that, it's got its own strong flavor. You know, mm -hmm. it's really, I guess, you know, Chunky is the, the word I would use to describe it. It just sits there in the middle of your taste buds. It's stunning. And it carries everything yeah, with yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Really stunning, I have to say. Like it's you're getting a warming what ABV? Uh, again, we're up towards kind of sixty percent here. So, so it's it's alarming that I like that so much <laughs> yeah. this time of the morning. You know, very much, <laughs> very much how you end up on your back quite quickly. You know, yeah, in the yeah. best kind of way. Yeah. yeah. But like Chevalier and beer gives a really unique flavor. Like there's a complexity in it, like layers of almost, like there's strong bready notes, virgin on marmalade, you know, and that is actually carrying, carrying yeah. through into the spirit there, which is really unique. I didn't think that was possible to do this with specialty malt, so yeah, this is super interesting yeah. for us, so. And it's something that distillers would have done, you know, back in, back in the day, that they would have been working with local barleys, yeah. Um, whatever was locally available, um, chopping and changing base malts all the time. But we've just, 
you know, the, the, the whole UK crop pretty much now is one, one variety, yeah. Laureate, before that concerto. Um, so there is a uniformity. Um, but playing around with yeah, Chevalier, these, these heritage malts, but also Maris Otter. Yeah. Maris Otter is an incredible barley when it comes to producing uh, whiskey. Yeah. Maris Otter was, was being used in the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of tons of this stuff was being sent up from, from East Anglia uh, into Speyside um, back in the day. And the, these older varieties, different genetics, there's a, there's a richness to them that you yeah. just don't seem, it doesn't, you, you're almost compensating these days with maturation. Yeah. Um, but you can provide that richness, that complexity through the spirit, you know, this, is, this isn't touch the barrel. Yeah. And we're getting all that complexity. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it's pioneering work, but it's also a massive nod yeah. to what would have been done hundred odd years ago and yeah. it's a lovely uh, nod to Taketsuru as yeah. well because he was he visited uh, Scotland at the turn of the century he was the basically the first ever Japanese guy to come to Scotland research it to call that research back to Japan and was the founding father of the Japanese whiskey industry yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a lovely homage to uh, yeah. the work that he did and indeed the types of barley varieties that would have been around at the time that he was that he was doing his research in Scotland. Absolutely, I think pointing that out, like our use of like Marisotter and Plumage Archer as well. I touched through another room about how that gives you a lovely like juicy fruity spirit. But I think what we're really finding is the different varieties of heritage stuff. It's much more texturally interesting as opposed to some just straight up flavour. Yeah. And I think that's why we enjoy pairing them up with maybe a more modern specialty malt is mm, mm. you get the kind of best of both worlds in that as you say we're ahead of the game in terms of the texture that you normally rely on drawing from the, the wood that we're going to use in maturation and then we have the flavour from the specialty as well so it's a great way for us to as you say get ahead of it and adjust our thinking completely so that when we're in the maturation stage some of those boxes are already ticked mm -hmm. and it just puts it on its head a little bit. No, I, I really love that, that the way that you've incorporated the pita character into it as well, because to go with pita spirit almost would feel like a bit too much of a sledgehammer, yeah. but just by using the pita feints is just enough to add that layer so that those other, you know, the, the, the complexity of the chevalier and the, and the sweetness of the amber is still coming through. And that to me is quite a Japanese thing, marrying yeah. and, and, and blending and, and just, just these subtle nuances and building up layers of flavour um, is, is really creative. Yeah. yeah. Is there any malts that it doesn't work with? Um, to be honest, no. I would say we have more of our issues on the east side of things. Right. That's where we get it wrong way more often. Yeah. Um, most of the malts, we've even run like full batches. We've done mashes of 100% Chevalier and the flavour is great. Yeah. Again, operationally, it's not so fun for the guys at the end of the day trying to clear the mash tun. That's yeah. where we learn our lessons. But in terms of how they work, you know, it's been really cool to play around with their inclusion. I mean, black malt, you're not going to be doing a whole 100% black malt mash, otherwise, yeah. you'd probably get about 30 mils of spirit out at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. But, like, it's cool to see how far we can take some of those inclusion rates before it just ruins the show essentially. Yeah. Um, but we've done, I feel like we're at the stage where we've done a lot of the R&D on these individual components and now we're in the really fun stage of seeing How they blend what together. ones work together and what yeah. ones don't. Um, but yeah, like I say, for us, the particularly good ones would be uh, crystal and chocolate. They seem to really lend themselves to the flavors of classical whiskey, you know, the, the mindset. But in terms of kind of tough customers, yeah, Chevalier is great flavour, but yeah, that's uh, it's like glue getting out of the mash tun sometimes, you know. But um, that's that's about as tricky as it's got. Like I say, we've been really lucky that they process really well for us, um, and it's more the yeast side of things where we get it wrong. Yeah. Do you play much with mash temperature? Uh, yeah, so we have a, a set that we try and set around the kind of sixty-four mark. Okay. Um, but we we have played around a little bit with it as well. Being in the city has its challenges as well of like water supply, you know, if everyone's out using the hose, that's going to affect how we can run our heat exchanger and things like that. So yeah. our temperatures uh, of the wort as well as the mash is quite key to us. But 
we, again, it's test, learn, improve, repeat. It's what drives everything we do. Endless data collection on every mash, every distillation, so that we can find that perfect temperature and we can yeah. find that perfect rest. And, you know, do we move the rakes this way? Do we move them that way? Do we spread it off the top? Do we have it going? Even those minute little things in the process can change it up so much. Um, we're really kind of looking at even at things like cloudy wort, yeah. you know, how that affects the flavour in terms of once it's through the stills. You know, obviously in beer, you're going to try and clarify it generally unless you're going for a hazy beer. But for us, that visual aesthetic isn't as much of a factor, so we can run that purely on a flavour point. Um, and all those little types of things are... Yeah, building kind of, blocks, the complexity. Yeah, flavor, pieces yeah. of the puzzle. Yeah. Look, I think it's exciting what you're doing. I, I also don't understand why people aren't doing yeah. this, and that's part of why we're here, yeah. <laughs> is to get that message out there and hope, you know, like obviously give you guys the credit for pioneering it, and give Crisp the credit, obviously, for making great malt, and, yeah. and they've obviously put a lot of investment into this with the PhD studies and the investments in the, in the plant and the specialty malts that are coming through, but yeah. um, there's exciting opportunity out there for distillers so like, get in touch with us or crisp and let's see what we can achieve yeah you know? absolutely um thanks so much for the tour look, this has been amazing so you're very cheers, welcome James. thanks cheers. for coming cheers. uh yeah look what an incredible visitor experience here and i genuinely mean that if you're in edinburgh make a point of calling in and seeing the guys um the quality of the spirits that we've sampled here are like they're outstanding if that's what new makes like i'm excited to see what the aged um, and the complexity of the barrel adds to the spirit um, we're really excited to to see how this develops over time and i do genuinely believe the guys are pioneering a new movement here so um, get behind it and if you want any more information don't hesitate to get in touch with us or any of our technical team check out the links below for hollywood distillery and until next time happy brewing